Four Beast of Daniel Chapter 7. This one's going to be really, really fun. I spent a long time on these slides. So let's just go ahead and get into it because this is a really crazy, crazy subject. Now, for those who don't know, I made a video on Daniel 2 talking about how Daniel 2, the statue of Daniel 2, is foretelling the rise of the Islamic Empire. Okay, I'll go ahead and link the video up here if you have not seen that. You need to watch that video before you watch this. You cannot understand the four beasts until you understand the statue of Daniel 2. Cannot stress that enough. Okay, so today, welcome in everyone. Got these beautiful, beautiful slides on deck. We're going to get into it. Daniel 7 decoded. All right, so this is what we're going to be looking at within this Bible study. Okay, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Daniel 7. We're going to be looking at the lion, the leopard, and the bear. Okay, these are the kingdoms, right? We're going to be looking at what exactly this means. Okay, we're actually going to be looking at the geography of all of these areas. I have all these maps talking about the geography, the kings, the kingdoms. We got them all. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. I think I have the lion map right here, also the leopard map. We also have the bear one as well. And we're going to be talking about the mystery of the fourth beast. I love this one. Okay, we're going to be talking about the little horn that arises on the head of the of the beast. And again, we're going to be connecting it back to the statue because all of this is connected to Daniel 2. All right. We're going to be looking at the geography of the fourth beast, which is a fourth kingdom. You'll learn that later on. And then we'll learn about the eternal kingdom that Christ is going to set up in the midst of all of this great cosmic war that's going on. Okay. We're going to be looking at, or also at the beast of revelation. Okay. The lion, leopard, and bear, the seven headed, 10 horned beast. We're going to be looking at it. And of course, how this all relates to the coming Islamic antichrist. All right. So pray for me. We're going live. We'll do questions after the fact. Let's go ahead and get into it. First of all, I want to go ahead and give a shout out to my kingdom members. Okay, you guys make making these slides worth it. I love you guys so much. If you guys want to go ahead and become a kingdom member, go ahead and click the join next to my channel. You guys can help. Um, all of the money goes to supporting these slides. I make these slides free for you guys. So the slides will be in the link in the description below. And also, if you'd like, you can become a patron as well. Get access to sneak peeks. I am currently... Two minutes out from Islamic Antichrist, the movie. So I'm making a full movie right now. I have all the sneak peeks on there. So go ahead and join if that's what you wish. So let's get into it. Daniel 7 decoded. So we're going to look at Daniel 7 uh, verses 1 through 2. So in the first year of, of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions on his head as he lay down in bed. Then he wrote down the dream, told the sum of the matter, and was told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts come up out of the sea, different from one another. This is where the beasts come from. Okay, here is the first beast that we are given. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground, and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. Okay, so... First off, very, very interesting imagery, okay? I I kind of put some uh, some taglines here for you guys to see. We see right here, it's a lion, okay? It has eagle's wings, massive, massive eagle's wings. Those, uh, those wings are actually going to be plucked off, okay? And a mind of a man was given to it. So when I was reading through this, I'm like, dude, what does the mind of a man mean? Like, what is what exactly is going on here? Well, the Bible actually describes it for us, Right. But first of all, I want us to point our attention to the great sea, right? It says in Daniel 7, chapter 2, or verse 2, the four winds of heaven were churning up the great sea. Clearly, guys, this is the Mediterranean Sea. Look at this map right here. The Mediterranean Sea, all throughout the Bible, is considered the great sea. We also see the same connection within Revelation. For some reason, I didn't put the verse. If somebody could comment the verse down below, I, I must have missed it. Uh, but look at this. It says in Revelation, after all of these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four. We got these four angels standing at the four corners of heaven. These four angels within Daniel, as opposed to Revelation, are stirring up the great sea. Out come these four great beasts. Okay, let's actually look at the second beast. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. All right. So we see right here, it's raised up on one of its sides. Okay. It has three ribs in its mouth and it 
is told, arise and devour much flesh. We're going to talk about what the three ribs and the one side, you know, lopsided means. That's actually a connection to Daniel 8. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, as for the third beast, okay, this one's crazy. After this, I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. Okay. Here again, this leopard, this beast has four heads on its back. It has four wings like those of a bird, very similar to the lion. And it was given authority to rule. So all of these kind of qualifications of these beasts are going to make sense. There's a reason why the Bible has all of these things. Why does this beast have four heads? Why does it have four wings? Well, the Bible is going to tell us a little bit later. We'll get into the interpretation right now. We're just looking at what the Bible is telling us. Okay. Now, here is the terrible beast. Okay. This is the fourth beast. After that, okay. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast. Terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from the former beast and it had 10 horns. So immediately we're given this imagery of this beast, right? It's different from all the former beasts and this beast has 10 horns on its head. Now there's a very interesting dichotomy here is that we actually see there is a little horn that arises from this beast. Uh, let me know what y'all think of this picture, man. Because I was showing this picture to some of my friends. They were like, man, this thing looks like a, like it got rabies. Like it's foaming at the mouth. Not a pretty picture. But this is what the Bible is telling us. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up from among them. And three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Okay. So again, here's that imagery of the fourth beast. Now let's check out kind of what the Bible is telling us from a visual perspective. So if you look right here, it has three horns kind of at the, at the tip of its head. And then obviously three of the first horns were uprooted before it. So three horns are literally uprooted from this beast from its head. Okay. And then from, from its place comes the little horn. You can kind of see it's very grotesque, but that's essentially somewhat similar to hopefully what Daniel saw in the vision. And then he says, while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up amongst them. It took or it uprooted three horns. Okay. This is the vision that Daniel was given. Now, this horn had the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So there's something different about this horn, right? There's something crazy. It's uprooting all these other horns. It's coming up. It's a big, nasty, weird looking horn. Now, what is the Bible? What do horns represent? Let's look at what the Bible says. Okay. But first, before, before we go into the interpretation, let's actually finish the vision. Um, as I looked, so th this is after the four beasts, as I looked, they're set or, uh, sorry guys, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were set ablaze. This is Daniel 7, 8. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousands uh, ten, times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Now, I want you guys to take a look at this imagery. This is the Ancient of Days. This is God the Father, okay? A river of fire is literally coming out of his throne. Think about that imagery, right? We A lot of us like to think, oh, Jesus, you know, God. The Father, they're merciful, which they are, but he's the most merciful being you're ever going to find. But from his throne is a river of fire that goes out and seeks judgment. It's like a flowing river of just judgment that's coming out. And it, it's honestly a terrifying image when you really understand what's going on. Thousands upon thousands are surrounding him. And there's a court scene taking place here. The books are open, but is sitting for judgment. What's going to happen? Well, the beast that we saw, the four beasts are actually going to be slain. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words that that horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Now the other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. Very interesting. Okay. Now here's where it gets even more crazy. In my vision, it's the same vision. I looked and there before me was one like a son of man 
coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, that river of fire, and was led into his presence. Okay. This term, son of man, I didn't put it in the slides. It's the bar enash or the bar enasha, which is the Hebrew term or the Aramaic for one like a man. So when it says one was come or one was like a son of man, think of it as just saying, look, a human being is coming up towards this throne of fire, the ancient of days, God the Father. It's a literal human being that's coming before him. He was led into his presence. Okay. He, this son of man, the Baranash, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is not it is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So there's a dichotomy here. I want you guys to understand this. Before we get into the interpretation of the vision, you need to understand there's two imposing figures that are imposing themselves onto the vision of Daniel. There's the little horn that arises from this beast. This little horn has the eyes of a man. He's speaking boastfully. He's, he's, he's arrogant. He's proud. Then there's another figure called the son of man. Who's the real deal. He comes up to the ancient of days and he is given sovereign power worship. We're going to talk about what this worship means, but this man, the son of man, this guy, he's the guy it's him. Okay. Whoever this man is, this guy is worshiped. So we need to understand that. Now, let me get a quick drink. Let's get into the actual interpretation of the vision. If you're in your Bibles, it's going to be Daniel 15 through 28. Okay. So Daniel, understandably, you know, he sees all this. He's like, man, you know what? He's talking to the angel. I am troubled, man. <laughs> he's like, bro, I don't know what this means. Can you just tell me what this means? I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. And the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all of this, right? Because it was an angel that was giving it to him. So he, the angel told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. These four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth, but the holy people of the most high will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Okay. So each beast, simple enough, represents a king. Okay. Now, Here's something we need to understand biblically is that a king also represents a kingdom. Very important. Why? In, like when, when people are saying this, do we just make this up? Do we just pull it out and say, oh, a king, a kingdom? No, the Bible actually tells us. When he says, I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which we're going to get into a little bit later, the angel actually says, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. So when there's a king, the king is ruling over a kingdom. They're the same. Okay. So a beast not only represents a kingdom, but it also represents a king. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. Okay. Now, this is where we, we connected to the statue of Daniel 2. Again, if you didn't watch that video, you need to go stop right here. I'll put the link again. Go watch that video. You have to understand the statue. The uh, first three beasts are connected to the gold, silver, and bronze kingdoms, which we made the case that it is Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece. There is no other case to be made. The first three kingdoms are named in the Bible as Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece. Okay. Now the first beast is Babylon. Okay. This is the lion with the eagle's wings. The, the king is going to be Nebuchadnezzar and the kingdom is going to be Babylonian, the Babylonian kingdom. This is the empire right here. That red dot that I believe is between the Tigris and the Euphrates river, which um, was the capital of the Babylonian empire under Nebuchadnezzar. You know, there was the Neo-Assyrian or the Neo-Babylonian Empire, but that's essentially where the capital is. Now, the second beast we know from the statue of Daniel 2 is Medo-Persia, okay? All throughout, I believe it's Jeremiah, it's either Jeremiah or Isaiah, we see, uh, you know, the king is Cyrus the Great, okay? Cyrus the Great, he's mentioned all throughout. He's the great conqueror. He was the leader of the Medo-Persian Empire, okay? We're going to kind of go into the lopsided nature of the beast a little bit later. That's essentially what that is. The third beast is, of course, the Grecian Empire. Okay. Under Alexander the Great, the kingdom would be the Macedonian Greek Empire. Okay. So we know what these four or these three beasts are, according to Daniel 2 and Daniel 4. Now, as for the fourth beast and the little horn and all that's going on here, um, you know, I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. Terrifying, okay? 
I also wanted to know, this is Daniel, about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Okay. Now, here's what's important, guys. We know these first three beasts, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. So the beast that I saw within Revelation 13 resembled a leopard, had the feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. Okay, so when you combine Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, you get the fourth kingdom. That's the idea. That's why the fourth kingdom is not named is because it actually says, look, this fourth kingdom as iron crushes and devours the rest. So this fourth kingdom will crush and devour the rest of these three kingdoms. Okay, that's what you got from Daniel 2. And you get the same thing within Revelation. So we know the fourth kingdom, right? Most people today are saying that this fourth kingdom is Rome. Okay. And as we've established previously, it cannot be Rome because Rome is missing the bear. Okay. The bear, which was lopsided under the middle, the Medes and the Persians was the, uh, was Iran, essentially Iran today. And, and Rome never conquered that, that far East. So people say, oh, well, the King must've been Nero. You know what I mean? It must've been, you know, one of the Diocletian emperors, the kingdom clearly had to be Roman. That's not biblical. Okay. Um, clearly the only viable option we get, there's only one empire that was after the Roman empire that can own, or that could be considered. And that's the Islamic caliphate. This is the, the geography of the Islamic caliphate as it was after the Roman empire. Okay. Dominated the middle East. And this is essentially where the, the antichrist is going to come from. Okay. We got so much more evidence, but I just, this is all Daniel two. I want us to move on to actually kind of getting more into Daniel seven now. I just had to remake kind of the case. We're going to get into new stuff now. Okay. Now, here's where we start to zoom in a bit. All right. Um, within Daniel 7, we see right here, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. Okay. Now, these 10 horns are 10 kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. So, having understood what Daniel 2 was telling us, now we understand that these 10 kings, these 10 horns, which are said to be 10 kings, have to be Islamic world leaders. Okay, I, I put, I did the best that I could to find kind of Islamic imagery, but they're going to be 10 essential Islamic kings that rise out of the caliphate in the last days. Okay. And of course, we have the little horn. So before we get into the, the, the little horn, we've already talked about Revelation. Okay, let's kind of take a deeper dive into this beast. You know, it was different from all the former beasts. It had 10 horns. We obviously have just learned that these 10 horns represent kings. And so the little horn also represents another king. Okay. Um, as I watched, here we go. This horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. All right. So this little horn, whatever this Islamic leader that's going to rise up amidst these other 10 kings, right? He He's going to arise. He's going to be different from the earlier ones and he will subdue three kings. Okay. Now, I think I may have forgot to, to erase three of the kings on this map. Just pretend that they're, that three of the kings are uprooted from this little horn. You can see him right here kind of in the middle of the map. He is going to subdue three of the kings. Now, Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 are going to, are going to zoom in even further, okay? Um, we're going to zoom in even further to where the geography is exactly the little horn's coming from. Because the Bible tells us exactly. He's, he's called the first king of Yavon, the first king of Greece. But that's later on. Um, we also know what the three horns of the three kings that are going to be uprooted underneath this little horn. That's also in Daniel 11. Okay. So you're going to have to wait for that, that part. I'll do those parts a little bit later, but we're just focusing on Daniel seven right now. Okay. Um, so verse 25, he, the little horn will speak against the most high and oppress his holy people, try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time times and half a time. Okay. So what does all this mean? That's the vision. Let's talk about what this actually means. Okay. 
because this is really important. We're actually going to connect this to Revelation 13. Okay. This beast within Revelation, because we know the beast of Revelation 13 is the same as the beast of Daniel 7. They both have 10 horns. They arise out of the sea. It's the same vision that we're given. Okay. This beast within Revelation, it says right here, this beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was allowed to, to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. Very, very important information. Okay. When we compare the beast of Daniel and the beast of Revelation, watch what's happening here. Okay. The Daniel beast, it says the, the little horn, he will speak against the most high. Now in Revelation, we're given more information. The beast opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling place. So when he speaks out against the most high, the ancient of days, he's not just speaking out against him in a general way. He's going against what? His name and his dwelling place. We'll get into that. Okay. Now within Daniel, the holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. That's a specific Jewish idiom for a specific period of time. Okay. Within Revelation, we're given the same thing. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now, a time, times, and half a time, this is a Jewish idiom, right? It's going to be for one time, for two times, and then for half of a single time. That's what's essentially happening. And when you when, when you equate that out into modern day terms, that's 42 months, which is three and a half years. That's why Revelation says, look, he's going to exercise authority for 42 months. It's clearing it up what the time, time, and half a times means. We're also going to see in later verses that he's going to exercise authority for 1,260 days, which is three and a half years, 42 months. It's, it's all connected. This is what is known as the Great Tribulation. Okay. Now, let's get into the blasphemy of God's uh, dwelling. Okay. Because this is very important for you to understand. Within the Bible, God's dwelling place is, is going to be Israel. Okay. That, that's where God is going to dwell forever. This is where the new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. You know, currently he's dwelling within our hearts. He's going to, he, he dwells within us currently due to the Holy Spirit, but he's going to dwell within Zion. Look at Psalm 132. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned for I have desired it. Right. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. So that's revelation. Guys, God is going to return to Israel to dwell there forever with his people. That is the dwelling place of God. This is what the little horn is going to be attacking moving into the future. Okay. Now I want you guys to understand kind of the biblical history of, of, of God dwelling within Israel, right? For those of you who, who don't know about the Ark of the Covenant, this is essentially what the Ark of the Covenant was, right? God essentially commanded Moses and Aaron to build an ark where God would dwell with them as they were moving through the Sinai wilderness, as they were moving through the desert, okay? In this ark, God literally dwelt there with the people. as w When they would move the ark, you know, and they would go into army camps, the armies would just be desecrated, right? So if we look right here, here's kind of the diagram, right? There I will meet with you. From above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So we have the mercy seat. It's kind of that big golden slab that's just beneath the cherubim, right? That's where you would open up the Ark. There would be the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, then there's the cherubim. There's the two, you know, the angels with the wings. God would dwell in the midst, in between the cherubim. That's where God's presence, his panach would literally be, you know, in that area. Okay. So God literally dwelt there within the cherubim. And guess what? Here is the key. You guys really need to understand this key. God had to dwell. Or sorry, I'm, I'm kind of losing my train of thought. The, or God had to dwell in atonement. Okay. So let's look at what this says. Leviticus 16, 14. He shall take some of the blood of the bowl and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he, the priest, shall sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. So in order for God to dwell 
on the Ark of the Covenant in Israel on earth amidst all of the people, it there had to be a sacrifice for sin because God is holy. He does not dwell, you know, in temples made by human hand. He literally dwells in the atonement of sacrifice. He cannot dwell amidst sin. He's a holy, holy God. So they literally had to take a lamb and slaughter it and take the blood, dip their fingers in the blood and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant so that God could dwell because all, all men have fallen short of the glory of God. That's essentially the key. Okay, so here's the key point. God's dwelling requires atonement for sin. He, let's look at a couple uh, biblical verses that support this. Hebrews 9.22 Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay. Leviticus 4.20. Thus shall he do with the bull, as he did with the bull of the sin offering. So shall he do with this. The priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. Okay. Then Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. So I cannot stress this hard enough. In order for God to dwell on earth, there needs to be atonement for sin, right? That is the key. Christ's death, right? Because remember within 70 AD, when the, when the uh, temple was destroyed, right? The Levitical system required the temple to be used in order to do all of these rituals. Well, the temple was destroyed. So currently the Jews kind of made up their own oral traditions to say, oh, we don't have to do the temple stuff like that. Well, guess what? 30 years, 40 years before the temple was destroyed, somebody named Jesus Christ came on the scene and he died for the sins of the world. He was the son of God. Now, Christ's death became the atonement, right? There's no more Ark of the Covenant. There's no more any of that because Christ became the atonement. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is John 1, 4 through 10. For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Christ's death within Matthew. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Um, Hebrews 7, 27. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer a sacrifice daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he, Christ, died or, or did this once for all when he offered himself up. So... That is the key, okay? Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now remember, in order for God to dwell on earth, here's the map, in order for God to dwell in Israel, there needs to be atonement for sin. Christ became that atonement. If you believe and have faith in him, he essentially takes away our sins. So God's dwelling, since it requires atonement for sin, Christ is the atonement. God will dwell on earth through Christ's atonement. Does that make sense? So God is going to literally dwell on earth after sin is defeated through Christ. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned for I have, des I have desired it. First Timothy, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony given at a proper time. Can I get a praise the Lord? Somebody said, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Cause this it's, it's a beautiful truth, but when you understand that this is all connected to the kingdom of the antichrist, what is the antichrist? What, what is this kingdom going to do? Well, it's going to blaspheme God's dwelling. It's going to blaspheme the name of God. So since Christ is the atonement, what did Christ himself say? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. I want you guys to listen to that. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. Okay? That's the key. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to whom the Son wills to reveal him. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. 
Guys, please listen to this. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. Okay? Now, here is the application. This is essentially how it works. Okay? There's man. And in order for man to be reconciled back to God, it's really simple. You have to have atonement. And Christ became the atonement. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on Him. Christ is the atonement. Now, let's get back to the kingdom of the beast. Here we go. Here's where it starts to get really, really obvious, really, really crazy fast. The ten whores that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast, right, the Antichrist, and they do what? They make war on the Lamb of God. What does that mean? I mean, does anybody understand? What does that mean? They make war on the Lamb. These 10 kings, the Antichrist, what are they doing? They wage war on the Lamb. As I watched, the horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. So, what is it going to happen? Well, let's look at what this, this Islamic kingdom is going to do when it comes onto the scene. The coming Islamic blasphemy. Okay? Because what does it say? It is directly tied to Christ. Okay? Islam is directly cried or uh, connected to Christ. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. This is talking about God. There is none like unto him. Say, he is Allah, the one. Allah, the eternally besought of all. He is not begotten, nor is he beget. Right? And say, praise to Allah, who has not taken a son and has no partner in his dominion, has no need of a protector out of weakness, and glorify him, Allah, with great glorification. So, there's a there's an anti-parallel that's happening here, guys. There's, a, there's an anti-kingdom, there's an anti-message. The Son of God, there's no Son of God, right? He, he has begotten the only Son. The, the Son has revealed the Father. Within Islam, he does not beget. It's a direct anti-parallel, okay? And then there's a direct attack on the Lamb of God within Islamic doctrine. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But another was made to resemble them to him, or him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. <clears throat> they have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. Excuse me. And they did not kill him for certain. Christ died. Christ did not die. Christianity, Islam. I hope you guys are kind of under or seeing what's going down. Okay. So let's actually look at this side by side. What happens in the biblical revelation? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him within his law. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. There is none like unto him. Okay. Hopefully you're starting to see it. Biblical revelation. All things have been delivered to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son and the one to whom the Son will reveal to him. And say, praise to Allah, who has not taken a son, and has no partner in his dominion, and has no need of a protector out of weakness. Right? For some reason, within Islam, it's like, oh, well, you know, Allah doesn't need anybody to protect him out of weakness. There's no weakness within the father and the son relationship. It's co-equal dynamics, right? They both complement each other perfectly. And of course, the foundational matter, the foundational war against the Lamb of God. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. This is within 1 Corinthians and within Islam. They certainly did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Okay? Are you understanding what's going on? So what Islam does is it says, look, your, your little atonement system that you got set up, we don't need Christ. Okay, we actually have the right path. We are the rightly guided ones. You'll, you'll actually hear them talk about, oh, we're waiting on the rightly guided caliph. We're waiting on the rightly guided leaders to lead us into the total dominion of Islam, right? Look at what's happening here. In order for man to be reconciled to God, there is no atonement. 
right? All you must do is look, you must perform the five pillars in order to work your way into heaven. You know, you have the Shahada, the Salat, the Sakat, Shah, or the Salm, and then the Hajj, which it's not really important in this discussion, but of course, you know, it's their declaration of faith, prayer, almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage, right? But they're all works. They're all works. There is no shedding of blood. Remember what Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So Islam currently has a system that is trying to, to reconcile humans to God without any forgiveness of sins, without any shedding of blood. If you knew the Father, if you knew um, Yahweh, what is what is the entire first five books of the Bible? It is about setting up a system to sacrifice animals because your sin is so bad, right? Leviticus, Numbers, all of it. So why did why does Islam come in the future and say, look, we don't need any of that shedding of blood, right? It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Clearly there's some sort of deception that's happening here, okay? Without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement for sin. Now, what does the Bible talk about the Antichrist? This is, you guys are going to hear this from me like a broken record. Okay, but this is the key, right? Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. Okay, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. Okay, so let's look at these two systems side by side so you can see exactly what we're talking about. On the right, you have Christianity, and on the left, you have Islam, right? So we have man who is sinful. We all know that. Okay. Only through faith and repentance in Christ sacrifice will you by grace enter heaven. That's the Christian uh, kind of dichotomy of things. Only by Christ's sacrifice. You can only access God through Christ. Okay. Now let's look at the other side within Islam. You must perform the five pillars in order to work your way into heaven. You can access God without Christ. Okay? So hopefully I don't need to bark on this anymore because we're going to get back to the beast. But if you don't understand this, you don't understand this anti-parallel that's going on, this anti-Christ system that's set up within Islam currently, you're not going to be able to move forward at all. Okay? Because that's essentially what's going on. There's two kingdoms, two dichotomies going on here. So let's look back at this kingdom. Right, We saw these 10 horns, we saw these 10 kings who have not yet received royal power, but they're going to in the future very, very shortly. Believe me, this is this map is going to be very, very real really, really quickly, okay? <laughs> Believe me, right? Within this system, you saw this in the Daniel 2 video, Christ, you know, these kings, Christ never died. Islam is the true way to God. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten, right? That's the fourth kingdom. That is the fourth kingdom under the 10 kings, right? It's going to be dominion. It's going to be an Islamic dominion, a, a satanic stronghold over the earth. It is going to be a, a deception so unparalleled, so close to the actual truth that you can't even see in between the lines, right? These are of one mind. They hand over their power and authority to the beast and they will make war on the lamb. They will make war on the atonement of Christ for the sacrifice of sins and set themselves up as the true kingdom of heaven. That is the fourth beast. Okay. Now let's kind of zoom in on the Antichrist because this is where it starts to get more crazy. I hope you guys are enjoying this, man. We got a lot more slides to go through. It's going to get way deeper. So stay with me. You're right. We saw that this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them, right? This, the, the Antichrist, the specific king, not just the 10 kings, the specific guy, he is speaking blasphemy. He is he is the one that's leading all of it. He's like, guys, there is no atonement. What are you talking about, right? He is the one that's waging war against the holy people and defeating them, you know, uttering blasphemies, stuff like that. So the little horn wages war on the holy people and the people of the covenant. We're going to see that within Daniel 11. Again, this map, we're going to zoom in. Every single time we do a series like this, we're going to zoom in even closer. Okay, but right now we're, we're kind of at a macro level, um, meaning he will wage war on Jews and Christians. Okay, this little horn, this Antichrist, specifically is going to wage war against the people of the covenant, the people of the book, right? He will blaspheme God's dwelling place, which is Israel, and the people in whom God dwells. He will set up his kingdom of blasphemy, which fundamentally is Antichrist. 
These kings, these Islamic majority nations that are within the lion, leopard, and bear regions will submit to his authority. They're going, it, it literally says they will hand over their authority and will wage war on the Lamb of God and his followers. Okay. Death to the people of the covenant. You're going to hear all these different things from the Antichrist. That's what's going on within Revelation and within Daniel. Okay. Is it's going to be a massive persecution. It's going to be a massive effort to destroy the message of Christ, the biblical message in the last days under this Islamic king. Okay. He will speak against the most high and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half the time. Okay. So remembering that a time, times, and half a time, it's a Jewish idiom that represents a specific period of time that the little horn will reign. Okay. So he, this, this king, this Islamic king, he's going to reign for literally three and a half years. So think about this, guys. Think about this practically. Whenever this guy comes on the scene and this beast unifies as, right, this beast, there was the, the, one of the heads was wounded. It's revived. People wondered at the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? God is going to literally allow the Islamic kingdom to reign for three and a half years. So it's going to look like Islam is the true kingdom. It's going to look like, wow, this is the real religion. This is real. This guy is. It's going to be so convincing, right? What does the Bible say? Oh, actually, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, guys, but there's a there's a key to that. So the Antichrist will set up his kingdom and be successful for three and a half years. That's what's going to happen, okay? The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and he was allowed to exercise his authority for 42 months. Now, what's what's very frustrating, guys, is you're going to see a lot of people say, look, oh, well, you know, the, the 1,260 days, that's clearly 1,260 years because of the date of year principle, right? There's going to be a lot of talk like that um, saying, oh, look, the abomination of desolation, that's going to last for 1,260 years. Guys, that's not a biblical precedent, okay? There's a reason why the Bible and God literally saw fit to give us three different time zones that all equal the same thing. So with a time times and half a time, you could say, oh, well, that clearly that, or, you know, that must be, you know, 1,000 years, right? Well, what does Revelation say? 42 months. Okay, 42 months. Then the angel's like, well, in case you want to say that's, you know, 42 years, 1,260 days. You see what I'm saying? So it's going to be a literal three and a half years. It's not going to be some esoteric 1,000 year reign. It's going to be a literal three and a half years. Okay, so let's keep looking at what's going on because we're going to zoom in. Um, this is in Revelation. I was given a measuring rod like a staff. This was John. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God at the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Do not get confused. They're going to be clothed in sackcloth. Now, we're not going to talk about the two witnesses. That's that, That's for Revelation. We're, I just want you guys to focus on the trampling of the holy city. Because remember previously how we talked about God's dwelling place, how he requires atonement for sin. That's what this uh, abomination of desolation is. That's what this um, fundamental blasphemy is. Is setting up a kingdom as if it were the true kingdom of God, as if there was truly atonement, as if it is the real kingdom, when in fact there was literally no atonement. Because there is no shedding of blood. That's what's, it, it's total blasphemy to set up Islam as the true kingdom when only through Christ can you receive forgiveness of sin. It is, it is, it is an attack on the son of God. That's what this is. Okay. They will trample the dwelling place of God, the holy city for three and a half years. They're literally going to set themselves up guys in Jerusalem and they're going to, you know, do all these things, possibly set up temples. They're going to cut off half of the city. It's going to be a complete, utter disaster. Okay, this will kick off the Great Tribulation, which is known as the Abomination of Desolation. Okay, we'll get into what the Abomination of Desolation is in our Revelation series because that's a specific image. Okay, however, that's also tied to the fundamental blasphemy of, you know, the Islamic Antichrist message. But we'll get into that. Okay, now let's look at the trampling of the holy people. 
Christians and Jews will be required to face persecution during this time. Okay, that's just the key. You have to understand this, guys. Christian persecution is coming. And if you are within the region of the beast, you know, all of the Middle East, you're going to have to face persecution. It says within Revelation 13, 10, if anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is the patience of the saints. These are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. What is the faith of Christ? That he forgives your sins through his atoning death and sacrifice. So here is here is a very serious and sober message, okay? Because a lot of Christians today believe that they are going to escape this persecution through the pre-tribulational rapture. It is a total and utter lie, okay? The Antichrist throughout this series is seen waging war and conquering the holy people, right? How does that make sense? Oh, we're just going to go get whipped up in a cloud. He's going to take us away. And then, you know, the tribulation saints, they're going to know. He's going to conquer and trample the holy people of God. This Islamic kingdom, they're going to go into every house. They're going to go into every crevice. And they're going to say, look, you need to say the Shahada. You need to say that or Allah is the only one true God and Muhammad is his messenger or else you are going to die. Okay. And Christians nowadays are not being prepared for this. So if you are in the Middle East, I know I have a lot of Middle Eastern Christians in here. This is what's going to happen. Here is, here is a call for the patience of the saints. You are going to need to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Christ. And if you are going to be taken captive, if you are going to be uh, killed, the Bible literally says for three and a half years, that's what you're going to have to do. Very sobering, guys. Very sad, very sobering. But that is what the trampling of the holy people means. It is a call to endure to the end. They, they overcame him, the Antichrist, by what? The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. But only the one who endures to the end will be saved. So I plead with, like, we're not done yet. We still got a couple more slides, but I plead with you guys. When this happens, and it's happening today within Islamic countries, within some Islamic countries, including Iran, all these areas, if somebody comes to you and says, look, you need to deny Christ, whether it's through Islam or whether it's through any other system, you need to deny Christ. Only the one who endures to the end will be saved. So please, guys, you need to understand this. Now, authority, this is, a, this is about the beast. Authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life or the lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. So everyone on earth, when this thing hits, is going to worship the beast. What is the beast? It is the kingdom of Islam. We are the true kingdom of heaven. That's what's going to be touted, you know, under the little horn. Islam will last forever. We will dominate the earth, right? Everyone who has not been found in the lamb's book of life those who were who were who are covered under Christ atoning death, they will worship the beast. Okay, so that is the great deception that's coming. Let him who has an ear, let him hear. Here is an actual warning from Christ. Listen to this warning that he gave. I, Christ Himself, have told you these things so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will literally think he is offering a service to God. Why do they do these things? Because they have not known my, th the Father or me. They will kill you. They will persecute you. Why? Because they think they serve God, but they have not known the true God, which is me and the Father, the Father and the Son. They will deny the Father and the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Okay? That's the key. Now, here's the hope. Okay, that was really sobering. If y'all are scared, guess what? Christ is going to win. Okay? What's going to happen? As I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. Now, what's happening here is, you know, he's winning. You know, they're winning. They're going to win. And literally, as he is speaking his words of blasphemy, and as he's speaking, oh, you know, this is so great. I kept looking until the beast was slain. And its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. These other beasts, the lion, the leopard, and the bear, had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. This is going into the millennium. 
Okay. That's a whole different subject. And guess what? Who's going to come onto the scene to destroy the little horn? It is the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Can I get an amen? Somebody put an amen in the chat. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He, this man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. Okay? His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, remember how I told you we would talk about that Greek word, latreo? That word, worship, with like within latreo, does not mean serve. It literally means divine worship. So to, to any Muslim that is sitting in, in this chat, within Daniel, not even a Christian book, a, a Jewish book that was written by Jews who do not believe in divine figures, literally says there's going to be a man that will destroy this little horn and will be worshipped by all nations and languages. His kingdom will last forever. That is going to be the divine son of God the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he will prevail over this Islamic deception. He will prevail over the Islamic Antichrist. Okay. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So, amen and amen. That is Daniel 7 decoded, right? We're going to move into the question and answer period where, you know, within these live stream, I want to answer your guys' questions. But that is Daniel 7. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, okay? Because we went through a lot of slides. Again, guys, all these slides are going to be available for free in the description. So if you want to teach this in your church, you want to teach this to your family, go ahead and click that. Time is running short, y'all. I really felt pressed in my heart to make these slides free because a lot of YouTube channels don't charge you for this. But God was like, nope, you got to make this free. So yeah, that's Daniel 7. So for 30 minutes, I'm here to answer any of your guys' questions. Do you have any questions, any concerns that have come up do you believe these beasts are Roman? Do you believe, you know, anything I said was bogus? We're here to chat. We're here to talk about it. So Sunset says, thank you. Appreciate that, Sunset. These slides took me about a week to make. <laughs> so I really did the best that I could. At the end, Jesus will win. Don't worry. Keep believing and praying. Amen. So Rockstar, you're my mod. Can you go ahead and highlight any questions we have? Um, okay, so JC says, nice work, mate. Appreciate that. Ooh. So 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-11 states that there will be a deception where God will let the people in disbelief fall victim to it. Exactly. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. I'm going to go ahead and pull this up for you guys. Thessalonians... Uh, Let's look this up. God will send them a powerful delusion. Okay. This is what 2 Thessalonians tells us. Oh, excuse me. Let's get this up. And no, I do not read KJV. <laughs> I hate KJV. I mean, there's a lot of people in here that think KJV is like the only way. They honestly worship the KJV, to be honest. <laughs> Second Thessalonians 2. So let's get it up. Um, let me share the screen. Let's get this out of here. Go ahead and stay in the chat, guys. Sorry. So the man of lawlessness, right? We're going to connect. Let's go ahead and connect this for you guys about the man of lawlessness. What is lawlessness, right? What do we learn about lawlessness? Well, within the Bible, we learn that lawlessness is sin. He who practices lawlessness practices sin, right? That is the, essentially lawlessness. Now, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by a teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by a word of mouth. Don't let anyone deceive you in any day or in any way. For that day, the coming of Christ will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So 
if anyone is telling you all these preterists, all these kingdom dominionism guys, unfortunately, I know one of them. He he's a good friend of mine. Actually, I won't I won't talk bad because I don't like talking bad about people, but he's a guy that disagrees with this kind of theory because he believes that Christ is currently reigning in heaven. That's called amillennialism, right? Literally, Paul dismantles that right here. Do not let anyone with any teaching come to you and say the day of the Lord has already come, right? Um, because who's coming first? The Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. He needs to be on the scene before the rapture is going to happen. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. So hopefully he can come to his senses. Anyway, he will oppose. Oh, so right here. Until the rebellion occurs and the man of loss is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. What does that look like? Within the Islamic paradigm, you know, the Mahdi, this Islamic figure, he's going to conquer Jerusalem and he's going to proclaim it the capital of the caliphate. So he's going to be like, look, yo, I'm going to take over Jerusalem and we are going to have our capital from here. Right. And the new Islamic empire is going to rule from Jerusalem. Remember, there's no atonement within Jerusalem. So they're going to act, they're going to act like they have this atoning religious system when, in fact, there is no aton uh, atonement. Um, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now, you know, what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. Then the lawless, the lawless one will be revealed. And who is going to kill the lawless one? The son of God, the son of man, who we learned. He's going to come back and he is going to overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. Now, sorry, this is kind of a long-winded response. Here's the answer to your question. The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, the little horn, will be in accordance with how Satan works. So guys, there's a mystery here. Okay, this, this Antichrist, there's a satanic deception that's coming alongside of him, right? He's going to come in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve what? The lie. There's a specific lie that is going to be used during this time. And the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So what is the deception that's coming? It's going to be a very specific lie. How does Satan work? Satan is a liar. Okay. Satan isn't going to come and he's going to force his way in through some weird force. He's going to force his way in through a lie that is going to be so deceptive that it's going to look like the truth. That's the key. What does Revelation say? Uh, what do we see in Revelation? All who were not found in the Lamb's book of life the atoning death of, of Christ will worship the beast. Why? Because it is a lie. All right. Um, and all the way that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They refuse to love Christ and have faith in him. So God, for this reason, sends them a powerful delusion so that they will actually believe the lie. They will actually believe that Islam is the one true religion. They will actually believe that so that they will all be condemned who have not believed the truth, which is Christ, but have delighted in wickedness. That's the key. Now, remember the whole idea that Christ was talking about in his parable about the separation of, of, of the, the, the ram and the goats, right? Who are the goats? They are those who believe in Christ. Then there's the ram, those who do not believe in Christ. So God, in his wisdom, sends a powerful deception so that when he returns, when he's going to, to reap the harvest, it will be clear who is of the beast and who is of Christ. So how could you be any more clear if you make the statement that Christ did not die for my sins? However, I am a believer in Allah through, you know, all of these weird Islamic practices. Whereas, so it's going to be a clear dichotomy, right? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not perform many miracles in your name? Did we not perform many things in your name? Get, uh, what does he say? Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who practice sin. Who are the practices of, of, law, of lawlessness? Not just those who, who reject Christ and who reject, you know, who are atheists and who are Hindus and who are clearly not Christian, but it's going to be those 
who act as if they have the atoning, you know, or as if they are um, performing works to atone themselves to God through Islam, these are those who practice lawlessness. I hope I hope that makes sense, guys. Is it's going to be very clear through this strong delusion God is going to send, which is going to be the illusion, the delusion of Islam. That's what it's going to be. So, Rockstar, where are my questions? Let's see if you guys have any more questions. I'm devouring this monster. Actually, I need to put in my uh, charger. Jenny says she's a pre-tribulation rapture girl. Well, if you're going to follow me in this channel, get ready to change that view. <laughs> I wouldn't be bragging about that. <laughs> Where's Mystery Babylon? I have a video coming about that. Mystery Babylon is makes things a little more complicated. We're not in the Daniel series. We're not going to get into that so much. Uh, do I believe we will live to see this? Also, do you think it's a preacher rapture? Um, guys, do I believe we personally will see this happen? Let's get this up. Do I personally believe within our lifetime that we will see the Islamic kingdom come to fruition? Um, yes, I believe that within our lifetime, it's happening now. I had a video coming out with a, a lady named Terry. I'm still waiting on her to get back to me. If she doesn't, I might just make the video myself. There's something coming out called the Assam Congress, right? Where actually all of the Islamic nations are currently uniting, right? Under like these weird 10 Confederate nations. It's like this really weird thing, but they're actually uniting before our very eyes. And to those of you guys who have heard of all of the banking stuff that's been going on and the BRICS, there's a whole BRICS currency that just uh, was announced under Brazil, India. It's it's the acronym BRICS, Brazil, India, China, um, South Africa. And then what's, what's the other one? Uh, so B is BRICS, I is India, R is Russia. Sorry, Russia. Uh, all of these BRICS nations, they're coming, right? And so guess what? Here's the key. This is going to pave the way for the new Islamic empire to form. Why? Well, because America, it's, it's current GDP, it's current money system accounts for 24% of all of the, the global economy. Think about that. America currently has 24% of all of, of the global economy. This BRICS, the United Economic Front that just happened with these five nations, guess how much of their GDP accounts for the economy? 25%. So we, we are about to see the fall of the American uh, economic system, and we're going to see the rise of the Eastern economic system under these nations, which is going to pave the way for the Islamic nations to unite and form this economy. So do I think this is going to happen before our very eyes? Yes. Okay. If you guys want more questions about that, let's go ahead and get that in. Uh, Rockstar, can you go ahead and just keep putting like a couple questions on here? He says, I don't think there's a way for mods to highlight questions. Uh, are the Israelis the true chosen people of the Bible? Yes. Okay. We know that the Jews during this time of the Great Tribulation, it talks about in Zechariah 14 and how when Christ returns to save them from the Antichrist, when he invades, they're going to look on the one that, that they themselves pierced. They're going to look on him and they're going to mourn as, as a child or as a a mother mourns for an only child, they're going to mourn because they're going to realize they killed the son of God, their Mashiach. They killed him. And Islam is going to be the primary force that's going to come against Israel in the last days. You know, the great siege of Jerusalem, they're just going to utterly destroy Jerusalem. They don't care. They want the Jews dead. Okay. They want them dead. And so as uh, the Jews are calling out to Yahweh saying, please help us, help us. That is when Christ is going to return to save them and is going to return to save his church from the Antichrist. Okay. Hope that makes sense. Um, ooh, Anakin Skywalker's in here, man. Sheesh. He's in another universe. He's the chosen one. Uh, a Catholic priest named Jim Blunt said that God showed him that the Antichrist is alive now and is a world leader. Who do you think best fits this description by far? Guys, please, please do not buy into kind of these, these, you know, every single year there's a new vision of a new guy. Okay. 
There's a new vision of a new guy. The reason why I'm making these videos is to try to make it clear what the Bible says. Okay. The Bible makes it clear who these beasts are, where the geography is, what's going to happen with the Daniel 2. It's going to be a Middle Eastern thing. Now, are we going to be given specific information about who specifically this man is going to be? Well, no. But when I uh, come out with Daniel 8 and 9, it actually, so you see the map as it is, it's going to zoom in even further to the specific geographies where the Antichrist is going to come from. So we know from the Bible which nation is going to come from, which region. We also know which kings he's going to uproot. So that's essentially what's going to happen. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer one more question and I'm going to go because I'm feeling kind of lightheaded. <laughs> so, um, amen. Praise the Lord. That's why he's given us the Holy Spirit, our comforter. He will never leave us nor forsake us. You guys have any more questions or should I just hop off? The day of the Lord won't come until the Antichrist come. Doesn't the Antichrist appear at the beginning of the tribulation with the peace treaty? So the rapture is pre-tribulation. No, that's not true. Because um, when does when does the, the, the rapture happen? It's when the Son of Man, the uh, Christ, comes and defeats the man of lawlessness. Right? Why does why does Christ say when he's talking, you know, in Matthew 24, when he's talking about the signs of the times, his disciples said, look, when are all these things going to happen? When are all these things going to be? He gives the timeline of events, right? Let no one deceive you. When they say, look, here he is, do not believe it. If they say, look, he's in the desert, do not believe it. For as lightning flashes from the east onto the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, here's the cryptic verse. Where the vulture is, or, um, or, or where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So where the corpse of what is? The corpse of the Antichrist. So where the corpse of the Antichrist is, there the vultures will gather. That's the church. We're going to be gathered to Christ in the air when he returns to defeat the Antichrist. That's the rapture. We are going to witness the, the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of, of our Christ. So more videos about that to come. I need to get something to eat, guys, because I'm super lightheaded. So amen and amen. I hope this was really helpful. Stay tuned for Daniel 8, Daniel 9. We're going to get more specific about all this. I love you guys. Stay blessed.